Hello everyone, welcome to Simon's Book Club, where I'm going to be discussing some of the best books on mindfulness, neuroscience, communication, psychology, emotions, and lots of healthy ideas that aren't really well represented in our culture. In my first video on nonviolent communication, I really dug more into talking about violence. Understanding the spirit of nonviolent communication might be kind of tough if we don't understand what nonviolence is opposing. You understand what non-dairy is because you know what dairy is, right? So if we understand how communication can be violent, then this whole ethos of non-violence will be a lot easier to connect with. The book mentions how some people don't really connect with the spirit of non-violence and they just try to learn the skills of non-violent communication, kind of like a manipulation tactic or a trick to get people to do what you want them to do. It's like an update to the art of persuasion. And that's not the point. Nonviolent communication instead is the language we use when we are connected and compassionate. This doesn't describe how to stay uncompassionate and how to manipulate people. You can't appropriate this method for selfish goals. If you use nonviolent communication with the spirit of violence, with the spirit of controlling and changing people, then you're missing the mark. Hell, I'll be honest, I've used nonviolent communication a lot, and I don't get all of the things for which I make requests. Hell, I don't get most of the things for which I make requests. And that's okay. That doesn't mean that nonviolent communication isn't working for me. I would still use it even if I heard no's for the rest of my life. The spirit of nonviolent communication on one side of the coin is to not cause harm. And on the other side of the coin, it's to learn how to empathetically give and receive, even how to empathetically receive a denial of our requests. So if you didn't see my first video and you're feeling a bit confused here, I recommend you check it out. I really like that video. But now that we're here, let's talk about the nonviolent communication process so that you could express how you are feeling without blaming or criticizing others so that you could express yourself with kindness and joy in your heart. So this works in four steps. I'm gonna list them all here and then I'm gonna explain them in more detail afterwards. Step one, make an observation of something that happened without any judgment attached to it. Good luck with that one. Step two, express how you're feeling, what emotion is alive in you in relation to what you observed. Also quite challenging. Step three, express what value or need you have, which is causing that feeling, which comes the easiest for me, I think. And step four, express what specific action can be done so that your life can be made more wonderful. Sounds nice, doesn't it? I had a huge laugh with someone when they tried nonviolent communication. They remembered the four steps of observations, feelings, needs, and requests. And for them, the process went like this. What I've noticed is that you're greedy. And I feel that you're being greedy. What I need is for you to not be greedy. And so I'm asking, can you not be greedy? Ah, uh, so uh, we found that really funny at the time and we cried laughing and to this day, it still kind of makes me chuckle. Yes, yes, everyone. My humor has very much changed over the years. I am amused by this stuff now. The point is, I think that it's easy for us to remember the first half of each step of observations and feelings and needs and requests. The challenge arises in the second half of each step. So let's go over them a bit. And by a bit, I mean a lot. I mean, this is gonna be a long video. I'm sure you've already seen how long the video is. I don't know how long it is yet. I'm guessing probably half an hour. Step one, observation. Okay, so step one, what? is an observation. I went to a nonviolent communication workshop here in Lisbon recently, and the way that the facilitator described it was, imagine that a video camera is recording. I can imagine, it's doing right now. The camera has no judgment. It could just notice and record without any adjectives. So an example of an observation is, I have noticed that you've left your socks on the floor. The camera, can notice the socks on the floor without any interpretation needed. 
That's as close to being objective in our observations as we can get. It's just bare bones information stripped down of any values. An example of a judgment instead would be, you've been such a slob lately, or you don't clean the house, or you've disrespected my need for cleanliness, or you keep this house as messy as your relationships. <clears throat> the camera can't record that. Those are all judgments of what the other person is doing, and those aren't gonna be met with empathy. Here's another example. Instead of saying, you showed up one hour after the time we agreed to meet, which is just a flat observation, it's a fact. An example of violent communication would be, you left me stranded, or you were late, as expected, or you never show up on time. Can you see here how the statements with judgments can be painful to the people that are hearing them? The idea here is that the fewer points of interpretation or judgment that you put into your observation, the less resistance you're likely to encounter. If you add your judgment to an observation, the person you're speaking with likely has their own judgment of the situation. And then, instead of empathetically connecting with them, you're kind of more than likely to get distracted by trying to prove who's right and who's wrong. And personally, from my experience, I've never really found those discussions of rightness and wrongness ever kind of leading to a feeling of being compassionately connected. Judgment does not come from a place of empathy. A big challenge here is that the standards we use for our judgments are inconsistent and not agreed upon by others. Our values are complex and fluctuate depending on the circumstances. According to Rosenberg, our attention is focused on classifying, analyzing, and determining levels of wrongness rather than on whether life is being served or not. When I'm communicating in the way I was programmed to communicate, if my life partner wants more affection than I'm giving, she is needy and dependent. But if I want more affection than I'm receiving, she's aloof and insensitive. If my partner is more concerned about details than I am, she's picky and compulsive. On the other hand, if I'm more concerned about details than she is, she is sloppy and disorganized. Another example that I've heard a few women express, men who are assertive are strong, while women who are assertive are <laughs> I feel very frustrated when I hear a double standard in play. Don't you? It's really difficult to empathetically connect with someone if we think that there's a double standard happening. Even if you try to explain away your double standards with a but, 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 but it's not the same, you're not likely to be persuasive. It's not the other person's fault for not agreeing with you. I doubt anyone will agree to your point, even if you are right, if their needs for consideration and acceptance aren't being met. <sighs> when we use violent communication, when we really want to make someone change, well, we often see them doubling down instead. And so these judgments and criticisms that we give to others are tragic expressions of our needs. And the tragedy doesn't arise because the other person is stubborn. The tragedy comes from the words that we have chosen. Because really, underlying judgment is the implication that the person is bad or wrong. And nobody wants those labels on them. And they want to protect themselves from those judgments. According to Rosenberg, I would like to suggest that when our heads are filled with judgments and analyses that others are bad, greedy, irresponsible, lying, cheating, valuing profit more than life, or behaving in other ways they shouldn't, that we think they shouldn't, very few of them will be interested in our needs. If we want to protect the environment, if we go to a corporate executive with the attitude, you know, you really are a killer of the planet. You have no right to abuse the land in this way. Even before we've said a word, I think we have severely impaired our chances of getting our needs met. We're not likely to find many human beings who can maintain focus on our needs when we are expressing them through images of their wrongness. Amen to that. We're not going to get much changed if we keep talking about what's wrong with people. Let's start talking about what's alive in us by focusing on our feelings and needs instead. Step two, feelings. And while there's still so much more that we could discuss in step one, I don't want this to be a four hour video. I hope it's not gonna be one. So let's move on to step two, which is expressing our feelings. And for me, this was a very difficult step to get comfortable with and the one that I see other people struggling with as well. What we are doing in this step 
is naming the emotion that is alive in us and saying, this is what I am feeling. And that's not easy. It's not something I've been taught at home how to look at the sensations within me and to give them names. And it's not something I learned in school either. My family and education were mostly focused on discussing ideas and describing the world outside of us. But talks about the world inside of us wasn't part of the curriculum. Rosenberg suggests as much when he says that our repertoire of words for calling people names is much larger usually than our vocabulary of words that allow us to clearly describe what's alive in us, our emotional state. I went through 21 years of American schools and I can't recall at any time being asked how I felt. Feelings were simply not considered important. What was valued was, in quotes, the right way to think, end quotes as defined by those who held positions of rank and authority. Too often in my experience, we are trained to be other directed rather than to be in contact with ourselves. I've been speaking with some teachers now who say that emotional intelligence is part of their curriculum now, and I'm happy to hear that. But it wasn't like that for me back in my day before the internet was around. I'm old. <clears throat> Brene Brown, who I'm a fan of, along with every other middle class woman in her 40s, has a great book, and it's been adapted to a show on HBO called Atlas of the Heart, in which she's offering an emotional intelligence course and giving examples of how we could understand our emotions based on different TV shows and movies that we've seen. Check it out. It's good stuff. But it's not just our lack of emotional education that's challenging. It's also that we're very disconnected with what's alive in us. And we're so focused on what others are doing so that when we try to express our feelings, we're often still focused on what the other person is doing. It's very difficult for us to distinguish between our feelings and our thoughts. Like in that first example of the misuse of nonviolent communication, when I heard that, I feel that you're being greedy. That sentence makes sense grammatically, and you could understand it, I'm sure. But in nonviolent communication, that sentence doesn't work. Because what others are doing or being isn't a feeling in us, like feeling angry, sad, ecstatic, surprised, tender, fearful, or tired. Those are examples of feelings that are in us. I've linked in the info box below a list of common feelings and needs according to nonviolent communication. Maybe pause the video now and give them a read. Print out the list, put it on your refrigerator door. Do get familiar with expressing yourself with these words. Pay attention to what's alive in you and give it a name. There's a big bit of confusion here when we mix feeling words with non-feeling words, which are actually hiding a judgment. So I'll, I'll give you some examples. If I say I feel abandoned or I feel betrayed, ignored, unsupported, those aren't feelings according to nonviolent communication. They're still judgments of the other person's actions. So in nonviolent communication, instead of saying I feel abandoned, you would say, I feel lonely and worried because I need closeness and reassurance. Those extra words will give you a better chance of truly being understood. Or instead of saying, I feel misunderstood, you can say, I feel frustrated and helpless because what I really need right now is some consideration and empathy. Mm -hmm. Notice sometimes that when you feel ignored, for example, it doesn't actually show what you're feeling or what's alive inside of you. For some people, if you're wanting to connect, being ignored can be painful. But for others, if you're wanting peace and quiet because you're trying to read a book, for example, then being ignored is welcomed. Notice that it's not the action of ignoring that's responsible for the emotion. Being ignored can be both pleasant and unpleasant. It's really your own needs and current states that dictate what your reaction is to being ignored. And really, your internal state isn't something that other people have control over. It's on you. So here's a huge idea underneath this last point. It's one that I've noticed faces a lot of resistance, perhaps the most resistant every time I share it. Are you ready? Here goes. Ahem. You are not responsible for other people's feelings or emotions. I'm going to repeat that. You 
are not responsible for anyone's feelings or emotions. That's difficult to accept, isn't it? I know I found it very challenging at first, and I still kind of do, but sit with it for a bit. Just let it simmer and let me expand. If you've grown up being told that don't do this because your mother will be upset or don't say that because your father will get angry, then you might know what I'm talking about. If you don't get an A on your report card, your mother will be disappointed. If you bring home someone who isn't the same ethnicity as you, your father will be devastated. Many of us have been raised to believe that our parents' emotions are our responsibilities and that if our parents can't control their emotions, it's our fault. But it's not. Their emotions are their own shit, and how they process their emotions is on them. It's not on you. And just like how it's not your responsibility about how your parents felt, you are not responsible for anyone else's feelings either. How people process and respond to their emotions and to their stresses is their responsibility. It's not on you. An action that you did might be a stimulus, but it's never the cause. Also, we've internalized this idea of being responsible for other people's emotions so much that we often believe that other people's actions are responsible for our emotions as well. And they're not. You are responsible for your own feelings and reactions too. And you need to take care of your own shit. Mm -hmm. At least that's the idea with nonviolent communication, with the idea of emotional slavery, in which most of us seem to experience three stages in the way we relate to others and their needs. In one stage, which I refer to as emotional slavery, we believe that we're responsible for the feelings of others. We think it's our job to make everybody happy, and if they're not happy, we feel responsible and compelled to do something about it. This can easily lead us to see the very people who are closest to us as real burdens. Taking responsibility for the feelings of others can be very detrimental in intimate relationships. I regularly hear people tell me that they're frightened of intimate relationships because of this. They say things like, every time I see my partner in pain or needing something, I feel overwhelmed. I feel like I'm in prison, that I'm being smothered, and I just have to get out of the relationship as fast as possible. This response is common among those who experience love as denial of one's own needs in order to attend the needs of the other. In the early days of a relationship, partners typically relate joyfully and compassionately to each other out of a sense of freedom. The relationship is exhilarating, spontaneous, wonderful. Eventually, however, as they define the relationship as serious, now the partners start to assume responsibility for each other's feelings. Other phrases that I've heard for emotional slavery are when people identify themselves as people pleasers, or if they think that they have to walk on eggshells around someone. I'm sure that there are other phrases for this as well. If you can remember any of them, please share them in the comments so I could use them in future discussions. To get out of this emotional slavery, where we can understand healthy boundaries, huh? And move into emotional liberation, we need to stop taking responsibility for other people's emotions and to direct that responsibility towards ourselves and our needs. In nonviolent communication, in the last stage of development towards emotional liberation, a shift happens in which we stop avoiding actions that we fear will cause painful emotions and we start moving towards actions that we think will help enrich another person's life. We stop hurting ourselves for the sakes of others and we stop fearing consequences and we start living with joy motivating our actions. We don't avoid the negative but embrace the positive. How does that sit with you? It's easier said than done, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, you bet. Now, if that seems challenging, it might make more sense if we start looking at the third step and begin to understand the fundamental needs that we have as humans. Step three, needs. So I found that once I started to acknowledge that my feelings emerge out of my own needs and values and not out of the actions of others, I noticed a major change in me. I felt a lot less reactive around others. I didn't give them power over how I reacted. The actions of others that would usually be followed with me feeling uncomfortable or activated, I began to view them with empathy. People's reactions come from their unmet needs. I can meet that unmet need with compassion and understanding. If someone is feeling irritable because they stayed up late working on a project for a demanding boss, I could understand their need for rest wasn't met. And I know what that feels like. 
If someone is feeling scared because inflation is rampant and they're worried about being able to afford rent and food, then I know that their need for shelter and food are in jeopardy. And I know what that feels like too. If someone is feeling frustrated because they haven't been able to authentically connect with their friends lately and to express what's alive in them, I could understand that their needs for authenticity, empathy, and understanding aren't being met. And I know what that feels like as well. I find myself now able to hold space for what people are experiencing with acceptance and without judgment, with curiosity and without advice giving, with compassion and without violence. Instead of feeling activated and reactive, I could hold a mindful, compassionate presence for people when they are sharing what's alive in them. I can be curious about what's happening in them, to hear about their feelings and needs as they try to navigate this increasingly fucking weird world that we're in. And if they're comfortable with it, to explore with them what ideas and reactions they've learned in order to meet their needs. And then, if possible, after this understanding, is there some way that I could enrich their lives, even if just for a tiny bit, by helping them to fulfill any of those needs? I don't internalize anything they're saying. I don't take it personally. Because, again, their reactions are an expression of what they are feeling and needing, and not reflective of who I am. I find myself enjoying this way of communicating and connecting with people a lot more than the way that I used to communicate. And I've noticed many of the people in my life comment on this appreciation of it as well. Nonviolence feels great, really. Okay, so to put this preamble about, oh my God, I'm so good at talking to people now, in context, let me bring this back to the book here. The third step of nonviolent communication is to turn away from our outward facing, judgmental, controlling way of thinking and to turn inwards to look at ourselves and to clearly express what we are needing. Nonviolent communication suggests that there are basic needs that all humans share. And if you're familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which I went over in great detail in the first book club video that I made many, many months ago, then you'll understand this part fairly easily. If not, check out that video. It's a great video. So we have fundamental physical needs for air, food, and shelter. We have needs for meaning, self-worth, community, support, emotional safety, acceptance. We have needs for creativity, autonomy, for laughter. We have needs for empathy, warmth, and peace. We have needs for love. If our needs aren't being met, then we're going to feel some emotions to signal to us, to motivate us to get those needs met. And very often when we feel emotions, then we start thinking of strategies to get those needs met. And while there are a million different strategies out there, there are only a handful of needs. So being able to connect with people on their strategies is a lot more challenging than it is to connect with them on a more fundamental level of their needs. I mentioned this in the first nonviolent communication video and how the author listened to someone in a taxi get all Kanye West and start sharing his ideas about Jewish people. And the author, after a bit of time, was able to connect with the person's underlying anxiety and, and wanting to protect his family. And that, for the author, was understandable. That's something that you could connect with. And that's a way that I think that we could find common ground and connect with people more deeply and to find ways to fulfill our needs with strategies that can work. And while digging through people's ideas and uncovering what emotions and needs they have might take some work, that for me is still kind of the easier part of nonviolent communication. It's kind of just like translating a puzzle in a way. Here's the challenging part. The one that I still have difficulty with. I can hear other people's needs easily, but I face such huge difficulty in expressing my own needs. I know all the four steps of nonviolent communication inside and out. I know what words I need to say to compassionately express what's alive in me. But holy fuck, I feel so uncomfortable saying them. There is. Ooh, such a fear of being labeled as needy, 
as weak or as a burden. And that's some conditioning that's really hard for me to undo. I feel afraid when I express my needs because I imagine that people will distance themselves from me as a result. And I want to feel close and connected to the people around me. And this is where I feel that nonviolent communication challenges me the most. Even though I've really taken nonviolent communication to heart, so much so that I'm making these honkingly huge videos about them, and it's a goal of mine to become more fluent in nonviolent communication through sharing the message with you, through attending workshops on it, and through building a community. All of the ideas in the book that I've taken on so deeply, except for one, and this is it. When it comes to the expression of our needs and requests, the author suggests that we do so with what he calls a Santa Claus attitude, a sense of jolly merriment. And listen to this audio here. So in our training, we show people how to have what I call a Santa Claus attitude when expressing your needs, to see our needs as a gift to others. It gives others an opportunity to see what's alive in us and to contribute to our well-being. So instead of expressing our needs with what I call a kick-me attitude, like if we want some support from our neighbor and watching our children for a few minutes while we go and do something, instead of saying with this kick-me attitude that comes from thinking our needs are a burden, uh, 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 I know you're very busy and, and I don't like to bother you, but you know, I, I have something very important to do and I, I need some support in helping helping with the children, would you watch them for a few minutes? You see, what an attitude. If we have that attitude toward our own needs, why would we expect other people to value our needs? So I suggest we express our needs with a Santa Claus attitude, that we have an awareness that our needs are a precious gift. So we go to the neighbor, ho, 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 you lucky person. I'm going to tell you about my needs for some support right now. For the life of me, I just have such difficulty taking on that attitude. For real, I notice that when I usually express my needs, I do so sheepishly and I feel small and I experience a great feeling of guilt. So for me to be like, ho, 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 I've got some needs. I think you're going to be f***ing thrilled to meet. Hey, that just, mm, that just feels so uncomfortable for me and it feels insincere. I love the idea behind it though. It makes sense to me. When I express my needs to you, I'm actually giving you a gift because I know that bringing joy to someone's life is very fulfilling. It feels great. I think you know what that feels like as well. And so when someone makes a request to meet their needs, it's a gift to share joy. Congratulations, you win the chance to do something kind for which we'll both be happy. I just don't know how to say that and feel it. I understand the reasoning behind it and I get the spirit, high tides raise all boats. When I help you, because we're interconnected, I'm helping myself as well and helping the community that I live in. But it still feels so tough to embody when I'm asking for help. I'll get there though, but it's a challenge. Here goes. Hey, I've got a gift I'd like to share with you. I really want to make these videos in the future. This feels like my calling. I've dedicated a lot of my time to share these messages of nonviolence and compassion and connection, and I'd be very appreciative of your support here. So please, join my Patreon. You can offer five or $10 a month, whatever you're comfortable with. And I'll keep on deeply engaging with the books that I think are really transformational and important and spreading the ideas that I believe can really make a wholesome difference. My message here is of love, compassion, empathy, mindfulness, and connection, and community. I think there is a big enough audience here, and so I want to share this message with the people around me and to offer this love to the people in my community, both online and offline. Hmm. That was tough. Did that sound joyous? I, I hope so. I really believe in what I can do here, and I think that this is a cause that's worthy. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Now, that's all I'm going to say about nonviolent communication for this video, even though there are many more ideas that we could really dig into, like how to receive empathetically, what conflict resolution looks like through nonviolent communication, uh, requests versus demands positive action language, and 
even just digging more into the idea of emotional slavery. Even though this video is already quite long, there's still so much more to say, and I want to make these videos more digestible. I still have a few ideas that I want to expand on, and I'll get back to them in a couple of months when we revisit nonviolent communication in another really great book. But for now, let's this will be it for here. If you are really interested in developing your compassion, then I think this book is really going to speak to you. It shows us how to refrain from judging others. Uh, it shows us how to get in touch with our feelings and with our needs, which is big right now. It shows us how to take things less personally and how to overall connect with the spirit of compassion and kindness. I would love to read how you feel about these ideas and if they resonate with you. If you're reading the book as well, come join the community that I'm a part of on Discord. We have over there a very nice group of people. They are very self-aware and intelligent and open to share their vulnerabilities and their growth. And we're talking about the books that we're reading and the ideas that we're grappling with. They're great people. I, I really value having them in my life. And I would be happy to see you there as well. That's it for this month. Next month, we're going to talk about Lisa Feldman Barrett's How Emotions Are Made, which digs deeper into the idea of the feelings that we're learning to express with nonviolent communication. So if nonviolent communication has you saying, I'm feeling angry because my need for understanding isn't being met, then this next book is going to ask what it means to feel angry. Where does it come from in your body? And then it's going to go against all of the common ideas about the science of emotion. I, I love this book. I've already read it twice. I've listened to it like one and a half times. And I really appreciate how it's changed my understanding of emotions in a very big way. And I think you're going to like it too. I'll see you next month. Mwah.